Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, written by J.K. Rowling. Chapter 1. The Boy Who Lived. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley, of number 4, Privet Drive, were proud to say that they were perfectly normal, thank you very much. They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious, because they just didn't hold with such nonsense. Mr. Dursley was the director of a firm called Grunnings, which made drills. He was a very big, beefy man with hardly any neck, although he did have a very large moustache. Mrs. Dursley was a thin, blonde and nearly twice the norm normal amount of neck, which came in very useful as she spent so much time craning over garden fences spying on the neighbours. The Dursleys had a small son called Dudley, and in their opinion, there was no finer boy anywhere. The Dursleys had everything they wanted, but they also had a secret. Their greatest fear that was was that somebody would discover it. They didn't think they could bear it if anybody found out about the Potters. Mrs. Potter was Mrs. Dursley's sister, but they hadn't met for several years. In fact, Mrs. Dursley pretended she didn't have a sister because her sister and her good-for-nothing husband were undursleyish as it was possible to be. The Dursleys shuddered to think that the neighbour, what the neighbours would say if the Potters arrived in the street. The Dursleys knew that the Potters had a small son too, but they'd never seen him. This boy was another good reason for the pot to keep for keeping the Potters away. They didn't want Dudley mixing with a child like that. When Mister and Missus Dudley woke up, Dursley woke up on the dull grey Tuesday. Our story starts. There was nothing about the cloudy sky outside to suggest that. Strange and mysterious things would soon be happening all over the country. Mr. Dursley hummed as he picked out his most boring tie for work, and Mrs. We Mrs. Dursley <laughs> gossiped away happily as she wrestled a screaming Durs Dudley into, the high into his high chair. None of them noticed a large tawny owl flutter past the window. At half past eight, Mr. Dursley picked up his briefcase, pecked Mrs. Dursley on the cheek, and tried to kiss Dudley goodbye but missed, because Dudley was now having a tantrum and throwing his cereal on the walls. Little tyke, chortled Mr. Dursley as he left the house. He got into his car and backed out of number four's drive. It was on the corner of the street that he noticed the first sign of something peculiar, a cat reading, for, reading a map. For a second, Mr. Dursley didn't recognise what he'd seen. Then he jerked his head around to look again. There was a tabby cat sitting on the corner of Privet Drive, but there wasn't a map in sight. What could he have been thinking of? It must have been a trick of the light. Mr. Dursley blinked and stared at the cat. It stared back. As Mr. Dursley drove around the corner and up the road, he watched the cat in his mirror. It was now reading the sign that said Privet Drive. No, looking at the sign. Cats couldn't read maps or signs. Mr. Dursley gave himself a little shake and put the cat out of his mind. As he drove towards the town, he thought of nothing except a large order of drills he was hoping to get that day. But on the edge of town, the jewels were driven out of his mind by something else. As he sat in the usual morning traffic jam, he couldn't help noticing that there seemed to be a lot of people, strangely dressed people around, people in cloaks. Mr. Dursley couldn't bear people who dressed in funny clothes. The get-ups you saw on young people. He supposed it was some stupid new fashion. He drummed his finger on the steering wheel and his eyes fell on a huddle of those weirdos standing close by. They were whispering excitedly together. Mr. Dursley was enraged to see that a couple of them weren't young at all. Why a man had, why that man had to be older than he was, wearing an emerald green coat. The nerve of him. But then it struck Mr. Dursley that it was probably some silly, silly stunt. These people were obviously collecting for something. Yes, that would be it. The traffic moved on, and a few minutes later, Mr. Dursley arrived in the Grunnings car park, his mind back on drills. Mr. Dursley sat with his back to the window in his office on the ninth floor. If he hadn't, he might have found it harder to concentrate on the drills that morning. He didn't see the owls swooping past in broad daylight, though people down in the street did. They pointed and gazed open-mouthed as owls off, off, owl after owl sped overhead. Most of them had never seen an owl, even at night time. <clears throat> Mr. Dursley, however, had a perfectly normal owl-free morning. He yelled at five different people, he made several info important telephone calls and shouted a bit more. He was in a very good mood until lunchtime, when he thought he'd stretch his legs and walk across the road to buy himself a bun from the baker's opposite. He'd forgotten all about the people in coats, until he passed a group of them next to the baker's. 
He eyed them angrily as he passed. He didn't know why, but they made him uneasy. This lot were whispering excitedly too, but he couldn't see a single collecting tin. It was on his way back past them, clutching a large donut in a bag, that he caught a few words that they were saying. The Potters, that's right, that's what I heard. Yes, their son Harry. Mr. Dursley stopped dead. Fear flooded him. He looked back at the whisperers as if he wanted to say something to them, but he thought better of it. He dashed back to across the road, hurried up to his office, snapped at his secretary not to disturb him, seized the telephone and had almost finished dialing his home number when he changed his mind. No. He put the receiver back down and stroked his moustache. He was thinking, no, he had been stupid. The Potter's... Potter wasn't an unusual name. He was sure there were lots of people called Potter who had a son called Harry. Coming to think of it, he wasn't even sure if his nephew was called Harry. He had never even seen the boy. It might have been Harvey or Harold. There was no point worrying Mrs. Dursley. She had always got so upset at any mention of her sister. He didn't blame her if he had had a sister like that. But all the same, those people in cloaks. He found it harder to concentrate on drills that afternoon than when he left the building at five o'clock. He was st still so worried that he walked straight into someone on the way outside the door. Sorry, he grunted as the tiny old man stumbled and almost fell. It was a few seconds before Mr. Dursley realised that the man was wearing a violet cloak. He didn't seem at all upset to being knocked to, t knocked to the ground. On the contrary, his face split into a smile and said in a squeaky voice that made passers-by stare, Don't be sorry, my dear sir, for nothing could upset me today. Rejoice, for you know who has gone at last. Even muggles like yourself should be celebrating this happy, happy day. The old man hugged Mr. Dursley round the middle and walked off. Mr. Dursley stood rooted to the spot. He had been hugged by a complete stranger. He also thought he had been called a muggle, whatever that was. He was rattled. He hurried to his car and set off home, hoping he was imagining things, which he had never hoped before because he didn't prove of imagination. He pulled into the driveway of number four. The first thing he saw, and it didn't improve his mood, was the tabby cat he'd spotted that morning. It was now sitting on the garden wall. He was sure it was the same one. It had the same markings around it, uh, its eyes. Shoo, said Mr. Dursley loudly. The cat didn't move. It just gave him a stern look. Was this normal cat behaviour? Mr. Dursley wondered. Trying to pull himself together, he let himself into the house. He was still determined not to mention anything to his wife. Mrs. Dursley had a nice, normal day. She told him over dinner all about the ne Mrs. Next Door Neighbour's problems with her daughter and how Dudley had learnt a new word. Shant. Mr. Dursley tried to act normally. When Dudley had been put to bed, he went to the living room in time to catch the last report of evening news. And finally, bird watchers everywhere have reported the, nas the nation's owls have been behaving very unusually today. Although owls normally hunt at night they are, and are hardly ever seen in daylight, there have been hundreds of sightings of these birds flying in every direction e since sunrise. Experts are unable to explain why the owls have suddenly changed their sleeping pattern. The newsreader allowed himself a grin. Most mysterious. Now over to Jim McGuffin with the weather. Going to be any more showers of owls tonight, Jim? Well, Ted, said the weatherman. I don't know about that, but it's not only owls that have been acting oddly today. Viewers as far apart as Kent, Yorkshire and Dundee have been phoning in to tell me that instead of rain I promised yesterday, they've been had a downfall downpour of shooting stars. Perhaps people have been celebrating bonfire night early. It's not until next week, folks, but I can promise a wet night tonight. Mr. Dursley sat frozen in his armchair, shooting stars all over Britain, owls flying by daylight, mysterious people in cloaks all over the place, and a whisper, a whisper about the potters. Mrs. Dursley came into the living room carrying two cups of tea. It was no good. He'd have to say something to her. He cleared his throat nervously. Uh, Petunia, dear, you haven't heard from your sister lately, have you? As he expected, Mrs. Dursley looked shocked and angry. After all, they normally pretended she didn't have a sister. No, she said sharply. Why? Funny stuff on the news, Mr. Dursley mumbled. Owls, shooting stars. And there were a lot of funny-looking people in the town today. So, said Mrs. Dursley. Well, I just thought maybe it was something to do with, you know, her lot. Mrs. Dursley sipped her tea tea through pursed lips. Mr. Dursley wondered whether he dared tell her he'd heard the name Potter. He decided he didn't dare. 
Instead, he said, as casually as he could, their son, he, he'd be about Dudley's age now, wouldn't he? I suppose so, said Mrs. Dursley stiffly. What was his name? Howard, isn't it? Harry, nasty common name, if you ask me. I, oh yes, said Mr. Dursley, his heart sinking horribly. Yes, I quite agree. He didn't say another word on the subject as they went upstairs to bed. While Mrs. Dursley was in the bathroom, Mr. Dudley Dursley crept to the bedroom window and peered down into the front garden. The cat was still there. It was staring down Privet Drive as though it was waiting for something. Was he imagining things? Could all this have something to do with the Potters? Well, if it did, if it got out that they were related to the pair of... Well, he couldn't think to bear it. M the Dursleys got into bed. Mrs. Dursley fell asleep quickly, but Mr. Dursley lay awake, turning it all over in his mind. His last comforting thought before he fell asleep was that even if the Potters were involved, there was no reason for them to come near Mr. and Mrs. Dursley. The Potters knew very well that he and Petunia thought about them and their kind. He couldn't see he how he and Petunia could get mixed up in anything that might be going on. He yawned and turned over. It couldn't affect him. How very wrong he was. Mr. Dursley might have been drifting into an uneasy sleep, but the cat on the wall outside was showing no sign of sleepiness. It was sitting still as a statue, its eyes fixed unblinkingly on the far corner of Privet Drive. It didn't seem to so much as quiver when a car door slammed in the next street, nor when two owls swooped overhead. In fact, it was nearly midnight before the cat moved at all. A man appeared on the corner of... A man appeared on the corner the cat had been watching. Appeared so suddenly and silently, you'd have thought he'd just popped out of the ground. The cat's tail twitched and its eyes narrowed. Nothing like this man had ever been seen in Privet Drive. He was tall, thin, and very old, judging by the silver of his hair and his beard, which were both long enough to tuck into his belt. He was wearing long robes, a purple cloak which swept to the ground, and high-heeled buckled boots. His blue eyes were light, bright, and sparkling beneath, but behind half-moon spectacles, and his nose was very long and crooked, as though it had been broken at least twice. This man's name was Albus Dumbledore. Albus Dumbledore didn't seem to realise that he had just arrived in a street where everything from his name to his boots was unwelcome. He was busy rummaging in his cloak, looking for something, but he didn't seem to realise he was being watched, because he looked up suddenly at the cat, who, which was still staring at him from the other side of the street. For some reason, the sight of the cat seemed to amuse him. He chuckled and muttered, I should have known he had found what he was looking for inside his pocket. It seemed to be a silver cigarette lighter. He flicked it open, held it up in the air, and clicked it. The nearest street lamp went out with a little pop. He clicked it again. The next lamp flickered into darkness. Twelve times he clicked the put-outer, until the only lights left in the whole street were the two tiny pinpricks in the distance, which were the eyes of the cat watching him. If anyone looked out their window now, even beady-eyed Mrs. Dursley, they wouldn't be able to see anything that was happening down on the pavement. Dumbledore slipped the put-outer inside his cloak and set off down the streets towards number four, where he sat down on the wall next to the cat. He didn't look at it, but after a moment, he spoke. Fancy seeing you here, Professor McGonagall. He turned to smile at Tabby, but it had gone. Instead, there was a woman, uh, a rather severe-looking woman, who was wearing square glasses, exactly the shape of the markings that the cat had been around its eyes. She, too, was wearing a cloak, an emerald one. Her black hair was drawn into a tight bun. She looked distinctly ruffled. How did you know it was me? she asked. Dear prof My dear professor, I've never seen a cat sit so stiffly. You'd be stiff if you'd been sitting on a brick wall all day, said Professor McGonagall. All day? When you could have been celebrating? I must have passed a dozen feast and party on my way here. Professor McGonagall sniffed angrily. Ah, yes, everybody's celebrating, all right, she said impatiently. You'd think they'd be a bit more careful, but no. Even the muggles have noticed something's going on. It was on their news. She jerked her head back to the Dursley's dark living room window. I heard it. Flocks of owls, shooting stars. Well, they're not completely stupid. They're bound to notice something. Shooting stars down in Kent. I bet that was Dedder Dedalus Diggle. He'd never met... He'd never had much sense. You can't blame him, said Dumbledore gently. We've had precious little to celebrate for 11 years. 
I know that, said Professor McGonagall irritably, but that's no reason to lose our heads. People are being downright careless, out in the streets in broad daylight, not even dressed in muggle clothes, swapping rumours. She threw a sharp, sideways glance at Dumbledore here, as she was hoping he was going to tell her something, but he didn't. So she went on. A fine thing it would be if, on the very day you know who seems to have disappeared at last, the muggles found out ab about us all. I suppose he really has gone, Dumbledore. It certainly seems so, said Dumbledore. We have much to be thankful for. Would you care for a sherbet lemon? A what? A sherbet lemon. They're kind of they're a kind of muggle sweet I'm rather fond of. No thank you, Professor McGonagall said coldly, as though she didn't think this was the moment for sherbet lemons. As I say, even if you know who has gone, my dear Professor, surely a sensible person like yourself can call him by his name. All this you know who nonsense. For eleven years I've been trying to persuade people to call him by his proper name, Voldemort. Professor McGonagall flinched, but Dumbledore, who was unsticking two sherbet lemons, seemed not to notice. It gets so confusing if we keep saying you know who. I've never seen any reason to be frightened of saying Voldemort's name. I know you haven't, said Professor McGonagall, sounding half exasperated, half admiring. But you're different. Everybody knows you're the only one you know who. Oh, all right, Voldemort was frightened of. You flatter me, said Dumbledore calmly. Voldemort had powers I, n I will never have. Only because you're too, well, noble to use them. Wow, it's lucky it's dark. I've never blushed so much since Madame Pomfrey told me she liked her, my new earmuffs. Professor McGonagall shot a sharp look at Dumbledore and said, The owls are nothing to the rumours that are flying around. Do you know what everyone is saying about why he's disappeared? About what finally stopped him? It seemed that Professor McGonagall had reached the point where she was most anxious anxious to discuss. The real reason she had been waiting in a, on a cold, hard wall all day. For neither a cat nor as a woman had she fixed Dumbledore with such a piercing stare as she did now. It was plain that whatever, whatever any everyone was saying, she was not going to believe it until Dumbledore told her it was true. Dumbledore, however, was choosing another sherbet lemon and did not answer. What they're saying, she pressed on, is that last night Voldemort turned up in Godric's Hollow. He went to find the Potters. The rumour is that Lily and James Potter are... are that they're dead. Dumbledore bowed his head. Professor McGonagall gasped. Lily and James, I can't believe it. I didn't want to believe it. Oh, Albus. Dumbledore reached out and patted her shoulder. I know, I know, she, he said heavily. Professor McGonagall's voice trembled as she went on. That's not all. They're saying he tried to kill the Potter's son, Harry, but he couldn't. He couldn't kill the little boy. No one knows why or how. They're saying that he couldn't kill Harry Potter. Voldemort's power somehow broke. That's why he's gone. Dumbledore nodded glumly. It's, it's true, faltered Professor McGonagall. After all he's done, after all the people he's killed, he couldn't kill a little boy. It's just astounding, of all the things to stop him, but how in the name of heaven did Harry survive? One can only guess, said Dumbledore. We may never know. Professor McGonagall pulled out a lace handkerchief and dabbed her eyes beneath her spectacles. Dumbledore gave a great sniff as he took a golden watch from his pocket and examined it. It was a very odd watch. It had twelve hands, but no numbers. Instead, little planets were moving around the edge. It must have made sense to Dumbledore, though. Because it put, he put it back in his pocket and said, Hagrid's late. I suppose it was he who told you I'd be here, by the way. Yes, said Professor McGonagall. And I don't suppose you're going to tell me why you're here of all places. I've come to bring Harry to his aunt and uncle. They're the only family he has left. You don't mean, you can't mean the people who live here, cried Professor McGonagall, jumping to her feet and pointing at number four. Dumbledore, you can't. I've been watching them all day. You couldn't find two people who are less like us. And they've got the son. I saw him kicking and screaming his mother all the way up the street, screaming for sweets. Harry Potter, come and live here. It's the best place for him, said Professor Dumbledore firmly. His aunt and uncle will be able to explain everything to him when he's older. I've written them a letter. A letter, repeated Professor McGonagall faintly, sitting back down on the wall. Really, Dumbledore, you think you can explain all this in a letter? These people will never understand him. He'll be famous, a legend. I wouldn't be surprised if today was known as Harry Potter Day in the future. There'll be books written about Harry. Every child in our world will know his name. Exactly, said Dumbledore, looking very seriously over the top of his half-moon glasses. It wouldn't be enough to turn any boy's head. 
Famous before he can walk and talk. Famous for something he won't even remember. Can't you see how much better it'll be off he'll be growing up in a way that he's away from that until he's ready to take it? Professor McGonagall opened her mouth, changed her mind, swallowed, and then said, Yes, yes, you're right, of course, but how's the boy getting here, Dumbledore? She eyed his cloak suddenly, as though he thought he might be hiding Harry underneath it. Harry's bring Hagrid's bringing him. You think it wise to trust Hagrid with something as important as this? I would trust Hagrid with my life, said Dumbledore. I'm not saying his heart is in the right place, said Professor Dumbledore, Professor McGonagall grudgingly, but he can't pretend his, he's not careless. He does tend to, what was that? A loud rumbling sound had broken the silence around them. It grew steadily louder as they looked up and down the street for some sign of a headlight. It swelled into a roar as they both looked up in the sky. A huge motorbike fell out of the air and landed on the ground on the road in front of them. If if the motorbike was huge, it was nothing to the man sitting astride it. He was almost twice as tall as a normal man and at least five times as wide. He looked simply too big to be allowed and so wild. Long tangles of bush, bushy black hair and a beard hid most of his face. He had hands the size of dustbin lids and his feet in the leather boots were like baby dolphins. In his vast muscular arms, he was holding a bundle of blankets. Hagrid, said Dumbledore, sounding relieved. At last, where did you get that motorbike? Borrowed it, Professor Dumbledore, sir, said the giant, climbing carefully off the motorbike as he spoke. Young Sirius Black lent it to me. I've got him, sir. No problems, were there? No, sir. The house was almost destroyed, but I got him out all right before the muggles started swarming around. He fell asleep as we were flying over Bristol. Dumbledore and Professor McGonagall bent forward over the bundle of blankets. Inside, just vis visible, was a baby boy fast asleep. Under a tuft of jet black hair over his forehead, he could see a curiously shaped cut like a bolt of lightning. Is that where Professor McGonagall whispered Professor McGonagall? Yes, said Dumbledore. He'll have that scar forever. Couldn't you do something about it, Dumbledore? Even if I could, I wouldn't. Scar scars can come useful. I have one <clears throat> myself above my left knee, which is a perfect map of the un London Underground. Well, give him here, Hagrid. We'd better get this over with. <clears throat> Dumbledore took, Har took Harry in his arms and turned towards the Dudley Dursley's house. Could I, could I say goodbye to him, sir? Asked Hagrid. He bent his great shaggy head over Harry and gave him what must have been a very scratchy, whiskery kiss. Then Hagrid let out a howl like a wounded dog. Shh, his Professor McGonagall. You'll wake the muggles. So, so, sorry, sobbed Hagrid, taking out a large spotted, spotted handkerchief and burying his face in it. But I can't stand it. Lily and James dead, and poor little Harry off to live with the muggles. Yes, it's all very sad, but get a grip on yourself, Hagrid, or we'll be found. Professor McGonagall whispered, patting Hagrid gingerly on the arm, and as Dumbledore stepped over the low garden wall and walked into the front door, walked to the front door. He laid Harry gently on the doorstep, took a letter out of his cloak, tucked it inside Harry's blankets, then came back to the other two. For a minute, the three of them stood looking at the little bundle. Hagrid's shoulders shook. Professor McGonagall blinked furiously, and the twinkling light that usually shone in Dumbledore's eyes seemed to have gone out. Well, said Dumbledore, finally, that's that. We've no business staying here. We may as well go and join the celebrations. Yeah, said Hagrid in a very muffled voice. I had best get this bike away. Good night, Professor McGonagall, Professor Dumbledore, sir. Wiping his streaming eyes on his jacket sleeve, Hagrid swung himself onto the motorbike and kicked the engine to life. With a roar, it rose into the air and off into the night. I shall see you soon, I expect, Professor McGonagall, said Dumbledore, nodding to her. Professor McGonagall blew her nose in reply. Dumbledore turned and walked down the street. On the corner, he stopped and took out the silver putter outer. He clicked it once and 12 balls of light sped out sped back into their street lamp so that Privet Drive glowed suddenly orange and he could make out the tub a tabby clat slinking around the corner at the other end of the street. He could just see the bundle of blankets on the step of number four. Good luck, Harry, he murmured. He turned on his heel and with a swish of his cloak, he was gone. A breeze ruffled the neat hedges of Privet Drive, which lay silent and tidy in the inky sky.
the very last place you would expect astonishing things to happen. Harry Potter rolled up, rolled over inside his blankets without waking up. One small hand closed on the letter beside him. He slept on, not knowing he was special, not knowing he was famous, not knowing he would be woken in a few hours by Mrs. Dursley's scream as she opened the front door to put out the milk bottles, nor that she would spend the, he would spend the next few weeks being prodded and pinched by his cousin Durs Dudley. He did not know that at this very moment, moment people were meeting in secret all over the country and were holding up their glasses, saying in hushed voices, to Harry Potter, the boy who lived.